The Google TV streamer doesn't just signify the death of the hugely successful Chromecast line, it also brings Google's AI into the front seat of the living room experience. And as with everything AI in 2024, is it a game changer or is it a gimmick? And did Google make the right call by ending one of its most successful hardware brands so it could launch this? The Google TV streamer is, this time, a set-top device. That's quite a big difference from the dongle form factor of its predecessors. And though you could probably, if you wanted to, jerry-rig this device behind your TV with some duct tape or something, it's really meant for a shelf. And I'll get to why that is in a moment. But first, this device sure is pretty. It's got two color options, porcelain and hazel, which is a darker gray color, though notably no black option, which is kind of an interesting choice considering so many devices, including the TV sets themselves, are often black. Talking hardware, the Google TV streamer has a flat sloped surface that's really too slippery to place much of anything on top of, and I'll tell you why you don't wanna do that here in a moment. On the back is a USB-C port for power, and it's important to note that the power provided from the back of your TV set, if it has that little USB port, that's not gonna be enough. You'll be instructed to use the included power brick to do that. Also in back is a gigabit ethernet port, as well as an HDMI CEC port. And finally, that little button right there. It's a single use button that will actually sound an alarm on the included remote when you lose it around the house, cause let's face it, it's gonna happen at some point. And yes, it's as useful as you can imagine. It's an excellent feature. Now inside the device hides a MediaTek MT8696 processor, not the newest, system on a chip in the world. It was actually used in the Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K back in 2021. Now this could be a sticking point depending on how you view it. Let's just say that I encountered no obvious signs that the processor was underpowered during my time with the device. However, I am always wary of a new product with three-year-old internals just from a longevity standpoint. The Google TV streamer does have four gigs of RAM. That's double what you found in the Chromecast with Google TV 4K that came before it. And talk about a big time upgrade, the streamer has 32 gigs of internal storage, which is a whopping four times more than the previous device. A long overdue update in my opinion. Now the new streamer supports Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision, and HDR10 plus it can connect directly to your bluetooth earbuds for private listening that's a nice feature and now with the streamer there's support for matter and thread border router functionality now this is only really important if you have a smart home with matter or thread devices it essentially enables the google tv streamer to be used as a smart home hub for those devices now if you already have a hub this might actually be a less useful feature for you, but if you're building a smart home from scratch, this could really simplify your setup. And remember what I said about why it's a set-top box with a flat top? That's actually because of this functionality. It keeps it unobstructed in those scenarios, and this right here is a big reason why you might want to avoid MacGyvering this somehow to the back of your TV set. Okay, let's take a look at the included remote that has a pretty excellent feature that I didn't know I needed. Now the included remote is similar in shape to the remote that shipped with the Chromecast with Google TV. A pill-shaped design with a smooth surface that does make it slippery. Within one day of putting it into circulation in our living room, it slid into the cushions of our reclining couch and then proceeded to get crunched when my daughter moved the chair. Now, we saved the remote. Needless to say, though, my B-roll here looks a little less than perfect. Yours is going to be pristine by comparison. Let's just hope this doesn't happen to you. The directional D-pad on top is nice. I think my main complaint there is that the button in the middle isn't differentiated enough from the D-pad, makes it difficult to do things like use an on-screen keyboard without kind of slowing down your movements. Some extra protrusion there would have been a very nice solution in my opinion. Netflix and YouTube buttons down below, not my favorite trend on remotes, but at this point, what you're gonna do? But Google sort of makes up for this with the multifunction button in the bottom right. Now here, you have options. You can assign any app to launch. You can assign the new home panel to appear 
or you can have that button switch inputs on your HDMI CEC compatible TV set. Now I've been waiting for Google Home controls on my TV for some time now, and it does not disappoint me. I'll get to that functionality a little bit later. Hey, real quick, if you're liking this review, please consider giving the video a thumbs up or even better, subscribe to the channel. I have some pretty awesome reviews in the pipeline. Okay, let's talk about the software because arguably this is Google's biggest consideration here. Not only because it's bringing Gemini AI into its living room solution for the first time, but it's also adding other new features that give some extra life to the experience. So first of all, Google TV got some major updates that yes, you'll see in the Google TV streamer, but many of those changes are actually coming to other Google TV devices as well. So then, what can you expect to see? Well, let's start with the home screen itself. And <laughs> I gotta say, I am super torn right now. Because on one hand, it looks modern, it's flashy, it's big, bold, it's very much what you've come to expect in a lot of the other streaming devices. Depending on what you're looking at, the screen is filled with information, carousels, ratings, reviews, you name it. All the information you might hope to find can be found if you know where to look. The problem is, there is so much everywhere that it's really hard to settle into the experience. The inclusion of 150 free channels of live streaming content, a new feature called Google Free Play, is awesome, yes, and no doubt part of this noise. And I'm not one to balk at free stuff, but it's not just limited to the apps you have installed on the device. The home screen is littered with options and suggestions from all kinds of apps I've never installed. And you can't remove any of those rows even if you want to. Now, to some, these are apps ads on a $100 device. And to others, these are true attempts to show what you might be missing in a media landscape that's difficult to maneuver simply because there is so much high quality content hidden in plain sight, either perspective would be valid. Whichever side of the fence you sit on, be forewarned. Personally, I find it far too noisy and confusing. Sure, you've heard that Gemini is on board and I'll get to that in a moment, but that doesn't preclude Assistant from also being on board. The voice search capabilities are still managed by Assistant. That fact alone might not mean anything to most people, but it was a bit confusing to me. A row in the home screen offers up some voice command ideas. One of the many shown there was, what year was Alien released? The results there didn't actually answer the question. All I was given was a row of YouTube videos related to the movie Alien. Let's talk about the Gemini summaries. Now you aren't gonna find these on all content in the home screen, only along with some of the most popular content at the moment across all streaming services that you have installed. I'd say the blurbs are a need to have, not necessarily a game changer. They were sometimes helpful, but I'm not sure I'd miss them if they were gone, if that makes sense. One use of AI that is a nice glimpse of fun is the generative AI screensavers. And I was kind of surprised by this one. The UI has an ad libs sort of interface. And if you have the Pixel 9, you've already seen this. It's much the same as what we saw on the Pixel 9 with the AI wallpaper interface that's found there. There are a number of launch pads, kind of templates, if you will, uh, if you aren't feeling super creative, or you can choose to roll your own and throw whatever prompt you want at it. Now, don't expect it to give you what you're looking for every single time. Google has really tamed the guardrails on this feature to keep things safe and sane, especially because there are probably kids using this. If you do have kids in the house, I guarantee from experience, they are going to love playing around with this feature. And thankfully with the guardrails in place, it's probably gonna be relatively safe for them to do so. Now those images can be set to the screensaver or you can pick an album from your Google Photos library for the screensaver to cycle through. Now my only complaint here is that the photos shown in screensaver mode are pretty stagnant, no motion at all. So it feels a bit lifeless in execution. Maybe they're going for that kind of like, you know, large uh, frame approach versus kind of like a cinematic movement sort of experience. I feel like adding a bit or at least an option of a bit of Ken Burns would be nice. If not some sort of like parallax effect, something like that in the future would give it a little bit extra life. And finally, the feature that I'm strangely most excited about, having Google Home controls integrated into the TV experience. 
experience. And quite frankly, it's just as awesome as I had hoped it would be. And yes, I realize we can all use our voices or we can pull out our phones for these controls like we've been doing forever. But having the multifunction button summon the Google Home controls on screen, I love it. I've had this on my wish list for a long time now, so it's nice to see it arrive. Oh, and I know that Nest Cams can actually stream video into the Google TV experience with this update as well, though I don't have one of those, so I could not test it out. You're just gonna have to check that out for yourself. All in all, there's a lot I really like about the Google TV streamer. I very much so like the set-top design, the added storage, you know, the performance is snappy, streaming itself is very smooth, there's a find my remote button that's awesome and already come in very handy. And that Google home panel. There's also a lot to improve from the assistant Gemini confusion to the fact that it's twice as expensive as its predecessor at $99 to the insanely busy and not at all customizable home screen. I am certain that we'll continue to use the Google TV streamer for all the things it gets right here in the Howell household. And I'm certain we'll hope to see a software update that addresses some of the stuff it doesn't. Huge thank you to Anthony Brown, one of my amazing supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. And I could not do any of this without the executive producers, Jeffrey Maricini, Bill Rudder, WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina, Taylor Sunderhaas, and John Cuny. I appreciate you and all patrons immensely. Let me know in the comments what you think about Google's next generation TV streamer. If you get one for yourself, I'd also love to know what you think of it after using it for a little while. Drop that comment down below. Make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everybody.